On Friday, September 28th, the Norris Group proudly presented its 11th annual award-winning black tie event, I Survived Real Estate. An incredible lineup of industry experts joined Bruce Norris to discuss perplexing industry trends, head-scratching legislation, tech disruption, and opportunities emerging for real estate professionals. All proceeds from the event benefit Make-A-Wish and St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. This event would not have been possible without the generous support of the following Platinum Partners. The San Diego Creative Real Estate Investors Association, Invest Club, Inland Empire Real Estate Investment Club, Think Realty, Wilson Investment Properties, Coach Fullerton, First Lending Solutions, Property Radar, the Apartment Owners Association, MVT Productions, and Realty 411. Visit isurvivedrealestate.com for event information and see Amazon Prime or YouTube for past events. Gary Acosta is the co-founder and CEO of the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals, NAHREP, the nation's largest minority real estate trade association, and a 25-year veteran of the housing industry. He's also the co-founder of the Mortgage Collaborative, a cooperative, excuse me, cooperative uh, of uh, mortgage companies focused on increasing market share and profitability. Gary, we welcome you to our panel. And Sean, welcome you back up here. Gary, I'm going to start with you. Gary, could you tell us what the Mortgage Collaborative does for the industry? Um, Sure. Uh, the Mortgage Collaborative is about a five-year-old uh, organization. It is actually a co-op, which is a unique corporation. So it is essentially uh, a group of small to medium-sized mortgage banking firms that pool themselves together, and they use their collective buying power to negotiate better terms with vendors, partners, secondary market providers, and so forth. So it helps them become more competitive so they can compete with some of the bigger guys. They, they also share with each other in, in meetings what they're doing. Best practices. Working. Yeah. That's right. So obviously the, um, you know, the challenges, opportunities, just the process of managing smaller mortgage banking firms is different than the big firms. And, um, you know, you have the Mortgage Bankers Association that focuses on the entire uh, mortgage banking industry, uh, but co-ops like the Mortgage Collaborative uh, focuses on specific issues that are relevant to small and mid-sized companies, which are serving many of the local communities across the country. During the course of between the crash and now, you guys have had a lot of input on the legislation that finally huh. ended up. So you're talking about regulatory yeah. uh, legislation? input. <laughs> so, I mean, I, you know, I actually served on the uh, Consumer Advisory Board for the CFPB. I was uh, part of the initial group to um, serve in that capacity. So there's about 25 of us that provided input to the CFPB as it started the rulemaking process. So we were there from the beginning. Now, what would be the beginning? You're talking about 2009 or 8 or? So uh, what, Dodd-Frank was uh, passed around, uh, what, 2010? Does that sound about right? And so okay. um, I joined that committee um, in 2012. And so um, that's when most of the rules started to become implemented, like um, QM and all of the rules that we now know in the mortgage market um, that are affecting it in a pretty substantial way. So we didn't set the rules as a governing body, but we provided input to the staff and um, helped guide them. And I would say that uh, had we not been there, things might have been even more rigid than they were, um, that they turned out to be. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. Now, the final... Changes basically have been implemented just this year. Is that correct? And will begin in January? Well, I mean, if you saw the Dodd-Frank bill, I mean, it was a stack about this big of paper. So it, it was uh, intended to be phased in over a number of years. And so we're just barely at the tail end of that now. What will be the effect of the last part of it phasing in? Is it? <clears throat> well, I mean, there is, um, I, I think, you know, the process has been going on for several years now. Um, qualified mortgages, um, and that rule was established now, I think, four or five years ago. 
And we're starting to see the outcome of that a little bit. So it's kind of interesting because on one end, we're sort of implementing the last phases of that regulation. On the other end, you've got a new administration there that thinks that we need to scale back some of the regu regulations that were implemented. That's kind of happening on a dual track right now. So I think the net result is we're actually going to see regulations kind of take a little bit of a step backwards. Um, yeah, I think from a, from a business standpoint, um, most of us believe the pendulum kind of swung too far the other way. Right. Clearly before the crash, um, the rules were too liberal. Um, and it really made for an environment where uh, lenders were doing loans that really they shouldn't be doing. Right. Um, so it was necessary to come in there and tighten up those regs. Um, but I think that in doing so, it uh, created an environment to now, uh, I think there's people who should be getting loans that aren't getting loans because the, the regulatory environment has become so rigid. So seeing that sort of roll back a little bit, I think is good for the market. Okay. Sean, I've got to ask you, 3D printed house, you're talking about it's going to be in the back of your house in, in Truckee? By the way, I have nothing to input on this. <laughs> is, is it in Truckee? Yeah. Okay, because yeah. when you were when you were building the home in Truckee, what was the snow load? Yeah, that's what I was at. I was mentioning a friend of mine. What was the snow load you had to have in your residence? Wasn't it like 40 feet of vertical snow? Yeah, it was a combination of a 100-year snow event and a 100-year earthquake at the same time. <laughs> and your 3D printed house? Um, yeah, the 3D uh, printed house is designed to be uh, structural for the snow loads in Tahoe. Wow. Now, it, it's a guest house. It's 400 square feet. Right. So uh, an ADU, it would be just like an ADU. It's got a, a living room. Uh, that has a kind of a kitchenette, uh, a bathroom, and a bedroom. Do you see 3D printed, printed homes always being at the smaller or less expensive end of the market, or do you think that'll just meander its way through everything? Yeah. Uh, how many people can picture the Guggenheim, right, with the swirling in, in, in New York? Like, so there's no reason that things of that scale Right? It just becomes a lot easier to do, where it's kind of a, a marvel to do it when they did it. Well, you know me, so my brain over there is thinking, oh, say, oh, and I don't know, do we know the cost difference per square foot? I mean, is it a half or is it less than half? Um, so for me, for my 400 square feet, it's going to be 20% of site built. 20% of the cost of site bill. Okay. 20%. Okay. So unintended, unintended consequences. So you have this invention that can lower housing costs by 80%. But you have how many trillions of dollars of debt against already established values? <laughs> Not, I'm sorry I'm bringing this up. But <laughs> could I, just, I could just walk away from my house and say, I'd like one of those 3D ones printed up for 20 cents on the dollar. I, that'd be good to go. I'm, I'm being devil's advocate, but I'm just wondering, is that would somebody saying, wow, if we approve that, that could be, uh, become an issue? Um, yeah, perhaps. Uh, you know, but to what degree does maybe land value come up to offset that, right? I, I mean, the house itself was always supposed to be a depreciating asset, right? It, 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 decli it should decline in value every year. The, the, uh, at, at least if it's an investment, right? That's still the way the, the IRS treats it, et cetera. So, um, you know, that we've pulled so much life out of these homes is, is A, good in a lot of ways, but, uh, you know, I don't know that it's catastrophic if, uh, you know, it becomes easier to replace uh, them. Okay. Now, hopefully we've, there's a lot of questions there, though. What happens to the old home? What does that mean for waste, environment? And I think that this is... There's a, a long ways to go around all of this. Yeah. Okay. Um, Gary, I, every time you know, I look at the news, still about every week or two I see a lenders writing a billion-dollar check for something they did 10 to 12 years ago. <laughs> so does that have a chilling effect on any kind of aggression going forward when the industry is still seeing that? What they did back then, they're paying for a decade or more later? Well, I think it has. Um, and it's not just the fines. Um, it's also the 
the cost now because of the regulations to service loans, for example. Um, so there's no question that lenders are um, gauging their underwriting guidelines um, and factoring in that potential cost down the line. So it is affecting the cost, uh, and that trickles down to consumers. Um, but it's also causing a lot of lenders to kind of scale back uh, lending on what I would describe as on the margins. You see a lot of the major lenders, for example, who have completely abandoned the FHA program altogether. And um, so most of the FHA lending is actually coming from independent mortgage bankers, smaller mortgage enterprises. So Chase, a City, uh, I believe even Bank of America have dramatically curtailed their FHA lending because of the regulatory um, situation, as well as the fines that are being um, levied on almost every major lender uh, through something called the SAFE Act, uh, which is um, giving the government the, the capacity to uh, sue lenders uh, to up to three times what those actual loans were originally made for. So yeah, it's definitely affected credit availability and one of the things that I think uh, needs to be solved. When you say they, have, you know, they abandoned the FHA program, so even if they, their feeling is even if we did it perfectly correct and crossed every T and dotted every I, we could still have a losing effort. Well, I think they're, they're, the feeling is, is if you're doing a large volume of loans, um, you can do um, everything to try to minimize the potential for error uh, as much as possible. There still is going to be error. Um, you're still going to have individual underwriters make mistakes, calculating you know, uh, income incorrectly or whatnot, or an appraisal that maybe was, uh, you know, used comps that maybe weren't really the correct ones to use, at least in the opinion of uh, the, the federal government. So there, there's so much gray area in lending. Um, there's no lender who can solve for all of those things to be certain that they're not doing any loans that could possibly be construed as maybe um, done, you know, incorrectly. Okay. So with that risk out there, it's just caused people to say it's not worth it. What, what borrowers do you feel that really, aren't, really can't get a loan that should be able to safely be able to get loans in this, in this market? So one of the things that I think is, is uh, a little bit, um, I, I use the word you know, kind of camouflage out there, is that there's so much demand out there right now and there's so little supply out there. Um, we really don't get the sense that people who should be getting loans aren't getting them. Because still, for every property that goes out in the marketplace today, there's multiple offers, right? But as that sort of supply and demand uh, situation starts to balance itself out, and we see that starting to happen already, interest rates are creeping up, affordability is being affected by that, we're going to start to see the impact of people um, who really should be getting loans that aren't. There are going to be buyers out there who want to buy properties that can't. And those people that you're kind of pointing to, which are the ones that are on the margin and are not getting served, are self-employed borrowers, for example. So lenders have become so sort of, again, gone back 50 years in terms of the way they qualify risk and calculate income. Um, and for the reasons that I already said, they're afraid to make mistakes because the penalty for that is so great. Um, they're going to want to do loans for W-2 wage earners, things that are just safely in the box, people who make money uh, through self-employed mechanisms, who have second jobs, who do uh, drive Uber part-time or whatnot, which is a big part of our economy today. Um, they're not being served um, in the mortgage lending ca uh, capacity to the degree that they should be. And again, as the market starts to normalize a little bit more, we're going to start to see that. So. Uh, I think Fannie and Freddie are starting to recognize that that's an issue that needs to be addressed, and they're starting to pilot programs um, to, I think, quantify income a little bit differently. But it is a gap right now that I think um, is a challenge. Okay. Sean, it's always fun to hear what you're talking about. I, it was funny. I was watching the panel as you were describing blockchain and sharing of the one house where somebody gets this piece, another piece, and it was sort of glazed. I was so happy to see it. There was the same glaze that goes over my eyes. So I, was, I was happy <laughs> someone else was having that same issue. So you introduced me to this thing called Hyperloop. Yeah. So I went, on, I went online, I looked at it, and I mean, it's amazing that this is in process and actually it's, there's a, some of it's under construction as far as a 
an attempted uh, trial run in, in China with, from an American company. Um, but what is it? What is, what is Hyperloop? Yeah, so this is, uh, I mean, Elon Musk, I think, gets a lot of the, the credit here for this. But the idea is you take a, a tube, you remove the air from it, because air has a lot of friction, right? You move your hand, you feel the friction of the air. You remove the air from the tube, and then you put a, a car, you magnetically le levitate it, which isn't hard to do, and then you can push this thing, and it's going to go really fast. So, you know, the theoretical speeds they're talking about is maybe 700 miles an hour. So I came down from, from Tahoe uh, this morning, and if there was Hyperloop from Tahoe to the Nixon Library, I would have been here in 35 minutes. Um, you know, so, I mean, it obsoletes for the places where there are these tubes, it, like, it obsoletes air travel even. Um, yeah, uh, for that distance. Yeah. yeah. So this has really interesting implications for, for real estate that uh, occurred to me when I was driving. We were going down, uh, taking some dirt bikes and stuff and going down to uh, Sedona, and we drove from Reno to Vegas. And as I'm driving, right, you have a town with a gas station, let's say Fallon, and then you drive an hour, and then there's a town but no gas station. It used to have a gas station. You see it there. The pumps are there, but, like, it's dead. And then you drive another hour, and now there's a town with a gas station. But it's every other town as you're making this, you know, seven-hour drive, and half of them are, are dead. And, you know, I really started thinking about that on this drive. And I said, well, you know, geez, that's, that has to do with the increase in range and the fuel economy of cars. You don't need every one of those towns every, anymore. These towns still have 150 or 200 people, but they have to travel an hour to get gas. Right, and um, so I started thinking about that in terms of, of Hyperloop, right? So you've got all these suburbs kind of like, right, say out of San Francisco or down here, right? But now you could have a suburb 350 miles away that's a 20 minute tube ride. What happens to everything in between? Well, what, what you know, these new <laughs> green fields, like the Las Vegas build it and they will come, like suddenly becomes really interesting, you know, to go like, land bank property in the Sierra foothills, you know, with the idea that you're going to get a tube there someday. You know, I, it just, I find it fascinating. And I think it's one where there'll be big winners and big losers. Well, you know, I was just, you know, playing with it. Let's say it, it exists at some point from Riverside to San Francisco. So you could make a San Francisco wage and have a Riverside housing cost. Right. You could get to work in less than an hour and you don't, you're not driving. You're, you're getting there like that. So, again, unintended consequences. So would you really have a $2 million median price house in San Francisco? Probably not. No, but what you might have is those houses converted to, you know, high-end work center where nobody, you know, people don't really live in San Francisco perhaps anymore. I'm just one possibility, right? <laughs> and they all hop in a hyperloop to a utopian residential only where there isn't work, <laughs> you know, kind of place, but there's great mountain biking and, hey, we don't need cars, you know, whatever. You know, there's, there's all kinds of possibilities. You know, I learned, I learned years ago not to, like when he says stuff, I actually listen now because he, <laughs> he's, he's told me stuff, you know, starting 10 years ago and I'm going, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> when you were 10 years old, your, your dad bought you a computer yeah. For and that uh, obviously that turned out to be really a special gift. And it was so you, 1977, so that was really the first Apple II. So okay. it was very early. So your son. Everybody knows I'm 50. Your son Ryan, right? Ryan. Ryan, when he was 10, you thought out very well what you would buy him, and it was a 3D printer. And you mentioned that to me on a ride to this Nixon Library. What six, seven years ago? How old is he now? He is now 16, and he actually, he started a company uh, almost this time, a little couple months from now, last year, Okay. Uh, 3D printing, and uh, so far in the last uh, 10 months, he's earned $20,000 3D printing out of the garage of our house. Very cool. <laughs> So I think it worked. Entrepreneurship. I didn't think it was going to work for a while, right? He's playing, and he's, like, printing, like, Pokemon. Or, not, he does not into Pokemon, but he's, like, printing little stupid stuff. And I'm like, eh, well, it was an idea. And then this year it finally kicked in. Here's my question. Let's say he turns 10 
next month, would the gift be different knowing what you know now? Yeah, so that's, it's really tough. Um, you know, one of the things I think back about, you know, when I was 10 and, and you know, really a, the gift of a computer at that point and how simple they were. Like, I really understood the computer top to bottom, like how a dot went on the screen. I understood that, right? You really, you know, it, you really can't under, easily understand how a dot is on the screen with a modern computer now, right? It, it's just the, the, the level of technology has grown so much, right? Where, where do you do that? Um, you know, I still think we're going to see a lot more automation, robotics. I think anything in those those areas is going to be uh, important. Okay. And, so uh, you'd buy him a robot? Uh, yeah, you know, well, so, he, so here's a, it's an, actually an interesting thing because I have, you know, I, I've got a bone that I pick with all the STEM programs at schools, right? We're going to do a robotics program. Like how many people have their kids in robotics club? And it's, it's really the stupidest thing ever because it's like – it's the last step, right? First, you need to learn something about mechanical engineering and materials and software and circuit design and then artificial intelligence. Like, the last thing you do is you build the robot. There's all these other pieces. And there isn't a STEM program that I found in the country that really walks you through all the building blocks that get you not to assembling some robot out of a kit, but to really actually understand how the whole thing works. We don't teach that, and okay. that's a problem. Okay. Uh, Bruce, I, I bought my son a basketball on his 10th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. was, it, was it 3D printed? <laughs> <laughs> was it made in the USA? <laughs> <laughs> Gary, a question about the National Association of Hispanic Realtors. Yes. Um, what percentage, you don't have to be exact, but what percentage of the growth, let's say, of, of real estate buyers is very likely to be Hispanic within the next decade? Well, over the next decade, and this is um, in coming from a number of different sources, including the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies, that 55% of all first-time home buyers will be Hispanic nationwide. So it is a substantial part of... The growth um, in the marketplace for the foreseeable future, for sure. And their home ownership rate right now, the U.S. let's say is at 63. What percentage of home ownership? So it's about 47 percent of Hispanic households are owner households. Uh, but one of the reasons it's lower is because Hispanics are a much younger demographic. So it's approximately 14 y years younger than the general population. So they're just moving into prime home buying years. If you look at the Hispanic home ownership rate of Hispanics over the age of 50, that home ownership rate is about 63%. Okay. So home ownership is something that is central, you know, I think from a cultural standpoint for, for Hispanic families in general. Uh, they have a passion for it. We have a passion for it. Um, and I think it's great for all of our businesses. Okay. Um, I want to ask Sean one more question, and then we'll invite all the other panelists to come back, and we'll batted around for another half hour. Are other countries ahead of the United States in some of these technologies of Hyperloop or whatever, and does it, does it matter? I mean, like, if you follow Hyperloop, right, the, the projects for the companies that are U.S. companies that are building this, right, um, when you look at the initial places that are interested in it, it's Dubai right. and, uh, you know, Japan has some, some very fast trains without even getting into Hyperloop. So, you know, when it comes to fast public transportation, we certainly have not been doing it well. The Norris Group would like to thank its gold sponsors for supporting I Survived Real Estate. Coldwell Banker Town & Country, Guaranteed Rate, and Nathan Chiboya. In a Day Development, Inland Valley Association of Realtors, Jason Thorman with Coldwell Banker, Jennifer Buys Houses, Keystone CPA, LA South Ria, Las Brisas Escrow, Michael Ryan and Associates, New Western, NorCal Ria, NSDREI, Orange County Real Estate Investors, The Outspoken Investor, Pacific Premier Bank, Pasadena Phoebe, Pilot Limousine, Real Wealth Network, Rick and Leanne Rossiter, SJREI, Spinnaker Loans, South OC RIA, 
Tri-County Association of Realtors. You direct IRA services. White House Catering. See isurvivedrealestate.com for event information.